Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Snehlata Panwar from the School of Life Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Today we are going to talk on the module aggregates of lipids, which are basically uh, micelles, liposomes, and we're going to discuss the applications of these uh, lipid aggregates from the paper biomolecules and their interactions. So the main objective or the aim of this entire module is to introduce you all to the various types of aggregates that lipids can form when they are mixed with water and to discuss the implications of these aggregates in health and washing industry. So, in what situation do lipids form aggregates? Lipids will form aggregates when they are placed in an aqueous solvent like water. So, by now we all know that lipids are basically amphipathic molecules. They are immiscible in water but miscible in organic solvents. So, in situations where lipids are put in an aqueous solution or placed in an aqueous solution like water, these lipid molecules will start to aggregate and these aggregates are then termed as lipid aggregates. So depending upon the kind of lipid molecules that are placed in an aqueous solvent, there are three different kinds of aggregates that lipids can form. The first kind of a lipid aggregates is called as micelles which are basically spherical structures consisting of about few dozens to few thousands of amphipathic molecules. The second kind of lipid aggregate that is formed when lipids are placed in aqueous solution is called a bimolecular sheet or a bilayer, which is basically the uh, plasma membrane that uh, surrounds all biological cells. So as the name suggests, this bilayer is basically a two-dimensional sheet that surrounds all the biological cells and is about uh, three nanometers in thickness. The third kind of lipid aggregates that are formed are termed as vesicles. Vesicles are three-dimensional hollow structures that enclose an aqueous cavity. They are spherical structures just like the micelles, but the difference between these two structures is that while, while the micelles do not have a hydrophilic core, the vesicles have an aqueous cavity or hydrophilic core within them. So let's just have a look into the common features of the lipid aggregates, of the different types of lipid aggregates. So we know that lipid aggregates will be formed when an amphipathic compound is mixed with water. So the common features of a lipid aggregate uh, would be the following. So what will happen when this amphipathic molecule is placed in a water solution? Since this amphipathic molecule will have a polar head group, the polar head group will interact better with the water molecule while the hydrophobic part of the amphipathic molecule will avoid interaction with water. So in a lipid aggregate, the polar region interacts with the solvent, while the non-polar hydrophobic region will avoid interacting with water. And these interactions will occur in such a way that the tiniest possible hydrophobic area is exposed to the aqueous solvent while the interaction of the polar region with the aqueous solvent is maximized. Micelles are the, a kind of lipid aggregate that are basically stable and uh, they contain, like I have mentioned before in the introduction, that these micelles, they contain about a few dozen to few thousands of molecules uh, to form a spherical structure. So this spherical structure of a lipid aggregate when placed in an aqueous solvent is stable and uh, it, it is stable because the hydrophobic tail of the fatty acids tend to move away from the water molecules that comprise of the 
aqueous solvent in which the lipids are placed, while the polar head groups of the fatty acids try to maximize their interaction with the surrounding water molecules, thereby making this spherical structure called micelle a stable structure. So micelles in a solution will not form until a critical concentration of lipids is attained in this particular solution. So micelles can form only after a critical micelle concentration is reached, which depends on the kind of amphiphile that is placed in the aqueous solvent. For example, short tail amphiphiles like dodecyl sulfate will need a higher concentration to attain a micellar structure about one millimolar, whereas for um, amphiphiles that have longer hydrophobic tails and biological lipids will need a lower concentration in order to attain a micelle in the aqueous solvent. The lowest co the concentration limit for these longer, longer hydrophobic tail uh, containing lipids is less than 10 to minus 6, which shows that uh, longer hydrophobic tails will uh, interact uh, better with each other and will tend to move away from the aqueous solvent better when lipids are placed in an aqueous solvent. So we've seen that micelles are stable structures. Now let's look at uh, the situation in which uh, micelle formation is uh, favored more. So uh, when the lipids uh, are placed in an aqueous solvent, if the cross-sectional area of the head group of the lipid is greater than that of the fatty acid chain as is seen in free fatty acids or lysophospholipids or in detergents like SDS, in that, that situation, micelle formation will be favored. So basically, free fatty acids can form uh, micelles when they are placed in an aqua solution. Now, what do we mean by an increased cross-sectional area of the head group. Now, since the head group is polar, it, it is hydrated because it can interact with the surrounding water molecules in the aqueous solvent. So this hydrated polar head group is wider than its hydrophobic tail, as you can see in uh, part A of this figure. Now, we've already talked about a certain minimum concentration that is required for free fatty acids to form micelles when placed in the aqueous solvent. So this micelle concentration of lipid that is required to form a micellar structure is called the critical micellar concentration or CMC. So what happens if there are too few lipid molecules and what will happen if there are too many lipid molecules placed in the aqueous solvent? What will then happen to the micellar structure? So part B of this uh, figure shows an ideal uh, micellar structure, which is uh, formed when the critical micellar, micellar concentration has been attained. If there are too few lipid molecules that are present in the aqueous solvent, these lipid molecules would expose the hydrophobic area of the micelle to water. The hydrophobic area means uh, the hydrophobic core of the uh, micellar structure, as you can see in uh, part C of the figure. So if there are too few molecules, this hydrophobic core would get exposed to water. Whereas if there are too many lipid molecules present in the solution, then the micelle would become an energetically unfavorable structure because of the presence of the hollow center. Too many molecules will result in the formation of a large micellar structure and this large micellar structure would then flatten out to eliminate the hollow center because this hollow center will be exposed to water. So it will be energetically uh, unfavorable, energetically unstable structure. So in order to uh, remove that um, energetically unfavorable situation, this large micelle would flatten out to eliminate the hollow center 
But since the curvature will decrease at the flattened surface, it would also create empty spaces inside the micellar structure, as you can see in part D of this figure. So you need an ideal concentration uh, or the minimum, uh, the critical micellar concentration needs to be uh, attained in a, a solution of lipid that is placed in an aqua solvent in order to attain a perfect micellar structure which is thermodynamically favorable and um, energetically favorable and hence stable in the solution. So too many lipid molecules or too uh, few lipid molecules would result in energetically unstable structures which could then lead to the collapse of these micellar structures. So what do we mean by uh, saying that ionized fatty acids when placed in aqueous solvents will prefer to form uh, micellar structures. What do we first mean by ionized fatty acid? So if you look at the structure here, there is this structure shows uh, a fatty acid which has a polar head group and a hydrophobic tail. The polar head group has a carboxylic acid group on it which is deprotonated because of which this fatty acid is charged. Because this fatty acid contains a charge, it can interact with the surrounding water molecules. But the other water molecules that surround the hydrophobic chain of this fatty acid will not be able to interact with this hydrophobic part. And hence, this situation that you see here is an, a thermodynamically unfavorable situation. So in order to attain a thermodynamically favorable situation, ionized fatty acids in an aqueous solvent will spontaneously form a micellar structure which is a thermodynamically favorable condition for them. When that happens or when micelles are formed, what happens is the polar heads align themselves so that they interact with the surrounding water molecules maximally while the hydrophobic tails will aggregate at the interior of the spherical structure and it will release the water molecule that is surrounding them, thereby creating a hydrophobic core within the spherical micellar structure. So basically what is happening here is, why is this happening spontaneously? Why is this micellar structure being formed spontaneously um, uh, when ionized fatty acids are placed in aqueous solvents? It forms spontaneously because it creates a more stable structure in which we have uh, polar head groups interacting with each other via hydrogen bonds. Then uh, there are electric interactions, electrostatic interactions between the adjacent polar head groups that also makes them uh, more uh, stable. Besides that, there are um, uh, interactions between the hydrophobic tails of the fatty acids uh, that are also uh, keeping, that are also in, involved in making this micellar structure stable and the interactions between the hydrophobic tails are through uh, are basically the van der Waals interaction. This all these interactions together in this micellar structure uh, makes it a more stabilized system. So lipids such as ionized fatty acids will form micelles spontaneously when they are placed in aqueous solvent and this is also called as the hydrophobic effect. The aggregate structure that you see here is the bilayer, which we will discuss more as we move on. So the hydrophobic effect uh, drives or is the major driving force behind the formation of the micellar structure. It is the same hydrophobic effect that also allows the proteins to attain the three-dimensional structure in space. And it is the hydrophobic effect that is the driving force behind the double helix structures that the nucleic acids can attain. So in short, we can say that hydrophobic effect is the driving force that forms micelles that in fact, or in other words, that drives ionized fatty acids to form micellar structures when they are placed in aqueous solvent. Tendency of uh, amphipathic molecules to form micelles lends them the 
ability to serve as surfactants. Uh, surfactants uh, have a head region that is water loving and a oily tail region that is water hating. So in order to accommodate these two regions, these molecules will tend to sit at interfaces between water and another face such as oil or air. The tendency of the amphipathic molecules to form micelles uh, lends them the ability to function as surfactants and uh, surfactants uh, are of interest to scientists because uh, they, they are used in medicine as well as in washing industry. Surfactant molecules basically expand the surface and lower the surface uh, tension uh, wherever they are present. So how, what is a surfactant? Surfactant is defined as the natural detergent in the lungs that reduces alveolar surface tension and prevents the collapse of lung tissue. What will happen if the lung tissue collapses? If the lung tissue collapses, it will affect part or all of one lung, thereby preventing normal oxygen absorption to healthy tissues. And this can result in respiratory distress syndrome. So there is a natural surfactant that is present in the lung alveoli. And this natural surfactant is called dipamitoyl phosphatidylcholine or DPPC. So it is the protein lipid mixture that is uh, requisite for pulmonary function. The inside of the lung alveoli, as you can see in this figure, uh, consists of basically a thin film of liquid, which is highly curved as individual alveoli are very small. So these alveoli have a tendency to collapse about the high surface tension. 80 to 90 percent of the surfactant in the lung uh, is the dipamitoyl species of phosphatidylcholine. So since the alveolar surface is very small, so in order to prevent them from collapse during expiration, this uh, thin film of DPPC provides, prevents, is, is lined uh, in the inside of the alveoli and prevents this collapse of alveoli during expiration. The saturation in the palmitoyl chains of the DPPC allows them to extend in a straight form, which facilitates very tight packing of these lipids in the lung alveoli. So the DPPC molecules are arranged in such a way that their non-polar tails are facing the air, while the polar head groups are facing the alveolar cells. So what happens during expiration? During expiration, the surface area and the volume of the alveoli decreases, due to which the lungs can easily collapse. And this collapse is actually prevented by the presence of these DPPC molecules that have the ability to withstand the compression caused during expiration. So this film, like I said, is very rich in phosphatidylcholine and maintains the surface tension at very low levels, preventing the alveoli from collapsing. Respiratory distress syndrome is a condition that is seen in premature infants. And this condition occurs because these infants do not have enough surfactant in their lungs. And this condition is treated by giving the infants exogenous surfactants. So the next application of the surfactants comes in the washing industry where uh, surfactants are active ingredients of soaps and detergents. So in soaps and detergents, these surfactants are either derived from petrochemicals, vegetable oils, or animal fats, or a combination of these sources. There are three main types of surfactants that are used in laundry detergents, uh, anionic, non-anionic, and cationic. So what do these surfactants do when they are a part of uh, any detergent? So surfactants are the active cleaning agents that will perform three major roles. They will penetrate and wet the fabric. 
they will assist in uh, loosening of soil or dirt that is present on the fabric and this would be uh, assisted by the mechanical action of the washing machine they would uh, emulsify soils and uh, dirt and keep them suspended in the wash solution so how do these surfactants function um, during these this cleaning process so again the surfactant we know will consist of two domains uh, uh, the polar water loving head group and the non polar fatty or hydrophobic tail so uh, if you look at if you looking at this figure here uh, you see that how these uh, surfactant molecules arrange themselves on the surface of the water with the polar head group Uh, facing the aqueous solvent while the hydrophobic tail is away from the aqueous solvent uh, facing uh, the air since uh, water has a high surface tension uh, it uh, water surface will always resist distortion at its uh, surfaces when a detergent is added the surfactant molecules accumulate near the surface of the water because the non-polar tail of the surfactant wants to get away from the water so while they align themselves on the surface of the water in 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 the in the arrangement that you see in this figure uh, the water distorts as the surfactant will disrupt the bonding of water molecules on the surface as more and more surfactant molecules will uh, fit onto the distorted surface of the water Uh, more and more distortion will take place on the water surface and this will reduce the surface tension of the water thereby allowing water to permeate the otherwise non wettable surfaces such as fabrics eventually these uh, uh, molecules of uh, surfactant molecules uh, will will uh, um, enter the aqueous solution and uh, since the since dirt which could be um, oily in nature is non polar and uh, this this non polar dirt is present in uh, is surrounded by uh, an aqueous uh, water uh, solvent this dirt is not going to be miscible in the aqueous solvent but uh, the presence of the surfactant can effectively emulsify the oil in water and can then lead to the removal of this dirt from the fabric so uh, in order to in order to remove this dirt from the water the surfactant molecules need to be uh, present in a high uh, enough concentration so that they can uh, form um, so the micellar structure that is formed by the surfactant will surround the oil and once there is enough accumulation of surfactant around the oil the oil will be evenly suspended in water and will be removed eventually from the fabric let's move on to the second type of lipid aggregates that can be formed when lipids are placed in an aqueous solution and these lipid aggregates are termed as lipid bilayers in the lipid bilayer two monolayers of lipids will form a two dimensional sheet bilayer formation is favored if the cross sectional area of the head groups and the fatty acyl chains are similar such as in glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids or in other words you can say that bulkier lipids that contain a thick hydrophobic tail will spontaneously arrange themselves in an aqueous solution to form a bilayer structure the formation of the bilayer structure is the structural basis for all biological membranes wherein proteins are associated with the lipid bilayer these biological membranes are impermeable to most polar substances because the interior of the bilayer is largely hydrophobic in this double bilayer as we would see uh, eventually as we move on that in this double bilayer the polar head groups are exposed to the 
um, surrounding aqueous solvent with the hydrophobic tails in the interior. The, the two opposite layers of the bilayers are called leaflets. Core of this bilayer is largely hydrophobic. They are impermeable to most polar substances. A uh, suspension of phospholipids uh, can be disrupted using sonication to form liposomes, which are closed self-sealing lipid vesicles bounded by a single bilayer. And we will uh, also see what liposomes uh, basically are. We will go into the details of liposome formation and their application. Here you see uh, how the lipid bilayer looks like. How, it, how the lipids arrange uh, in, in an aqueous solution to form a lipid bilayer. And like I said, uh, that lipids uh, that have bulkier uh, hydrophobic tails will spontaneously form this kind of a bilayer structure that you uh, see here. Uh, in this in this bilayer, each of this layer is called a leaflet. And uh, both sides of the bilayer are surrounded by aqueous water molecules, which uh, interact with the polar head groups that are exposed to these um, uh, water molecules. Um, hence, one difference between uh, the micelle and the bimolecular uh, sheet is that uh, inside the micelle, there is no aqueous environment. While the bilayer surrounds, while aqueous environment exists only on the outside of the micelles. So in the bilayer sheet, as opposed to micelle, the aqueous environment uh, is present on both sides of the bilayer sheet. And this bilayer sheet then expands itself and uh, uh, to form a circular structure around the cell, thereby uh, creating a barrier around the cell. Part uh, B of uh, uh, this, this schematic uh, is basically a computer simulation showing the phospholipid molecules, which are depicted in red, and uh, the uh, uh, hydrophobic uh, tails that are depicted in orange. And the surrounding water molecules, um, uh, this is basically a cross-section of a uh, lipid bilayer. So it's a computer simulation of a cross-section of a lipid bilayer. And you see how the polar head groups are interacting with the, are exposed to the uh, water solvent and how the aqueous solvent is present on both sides of the bilayer and how the hydrophobic tails are interacting with each other in the core in the core of the bilayer sheet, making this core hydrophobic. So I've mentioned before that the hydrophobic effect is the major driving force behind the formation of uh, micelles. It's the same hydrophobic effect that's also the major driving force behind the formation of the bimolecular sheet of a, a cell membrane. Uh, so the cell membrane has uh, three major characteristics. One is that it forms spontaneously. And once it forms, it will form a closed compartment inside of which is an aqueous environment. So if you're looking at this figure here, you see that the planar phospholipid bilayer would have its edges exposed to water. And this situation would be energetically unfavorable. So in order to avoid this energetically unfavorable condition, the phospholipid bilayers close on themselves spontaneously to form sealed compartments. The closed structure that is eventually formed is stable as it avoids the energetically unfavorable condition where the uh, exposure of the hydrophobic hydrocarbon tails to water is taking place. So this is one of the, so the formation of the uh, bilayer sheet is also a spontaneous process, just like the formation of the micelles. And once the bilayer sheet uh, forms a closed compartment, the inside of this closed compartment is an aqueous environment. Now, another difference between the uh, phospholipid uh, bimolecular sheets 
and my cells is that my cells can form small structures uh, structures um, of uh, with diameters of about 20 nanometers while lipid bilayers can be very very extensive about 10 to 6 nanometer in diameter and that's exactly why our cells have lipid bilayers because cells can be very, very large in size and my cells cannot form such large structures around the cell. Uh, moreover, uh, the bilayer membrane also has the ability to fix themselves. And what do, what do I mean when I say fix themselves? Supposing there is a hole that is uh, formed in the bilayer. In that situation, the water molecules will be able to penetrate into the bilayer and will start to surround the hydrophobic tails. So in this situation, the hole that is formed will spontaneously be fixed to decrease the energy of the system or to make it energetically favorable structure. Therefore, Bilayers have this intrinsic property to fix itself, unlike the micelles. Lipid bilayer membranes are fluid structures. And what do you mean by fluid structure? Uh, within the lipid bilayer, the lipids can diffuse uh, laterally or they can diffuse uh, transversely, which means that they can diffuse from one monolayer to the other monolayer. Uh, while the lateral diffusion of lipid is defined as the rate of lipid diffusion within a lipid monolayer, um, this, this process is very rapid. As opposed to transverse diffusion, which is defined as the rate of lipid exchange between uh, the two monolayers, which is very slow, and this transverse diffusion as opposed to lateral diffusion is generally facilitated by specific proteins. Uh, these proteins are termed phospholipid translocators and are involved in moving specific lipids from one membrane to the other. As a consequence of this constant exchange of uh, specific lipids from one monolayer to the other, most of the biological membranes have unequal distribution of lipids in each monolayer of the bilayer structure, and this is termed as membrane asymmetry. So, for example, phosphatidyl serine is uh, more abundant on the inner leaflet uh, as opposed to the outer leaflet. And uh, therefore, uh, the membrane is um, termed as uh, asymmetric in the term, in the context of phosphatidyl serine. Similarly, the distribution of other phospholipids is also unequal between the two monolayers. And uh, uh, this, is, this is known as membrane asymmetry. So as I already mentioned that uh, the lipid bilayer membranes are fluid in nature, they, they are fluid structures. This fluidity of the bilayer varies with temperature. Uh, each lipid bilayer has a, a phase transition temperature, Tm, uh, which is uh, referred to as the melting temperature. And uh, by changing the composition of the uh, phospholipids that are present within the bilayer, the, uh, the fluidity of the membrane can be altered. So the, the melting temperature will increase with increase in chain length. So if the chain length of the fatty acids is increased, the melting temperature will increase as we have seen uh, uh, this, this when we were looking at the characteristic of fatty acids. On the other hand, the melting temperature will decrease with an increasing degree of unsaturation. Uh, because there is an increased uh, degree of unsaturation, there will be poor packing of bent tails. We've already seen that the presence of uh, double bonds lends a 30 degree bend to the fatty acyl chains, which prevents them from packing very tightly. This leads to loose packing and uh, the degree, as the degree of unsaturation increases or as the number of double bonds increases in the fatty acid chain, the fluidity of the membrane will change accordingly. The TM 
can also be modulated uh, by the presence of cholesterol, which is also an important constituent of the plasma membrane. Uh, the presence of cholesterol broadens the effective melting temperature, uh, which means that it will lower the melting temperature at high temperatures and will increase the melting temperature at low temperature. And we will see how uh, the packing of lipids uh, affects the fluidity of the membrane as we move on. So as I mentioned uh, that the type of fatty acid will have an influence on the packing of membrane lipids within a lipid bilayer. What do we mean by that? Uh, we've already seen that saturated fatty acids, as you can see in this figure, will pack together very tightly within the membrane. And um, I want to mention here that uh, phosphatidylcholine, uh, one of the glycerophospholipid, is the most common membrane lipid that is present in the cell membrane. So saturated fatty acids will pack tightly within the lipid bilayer, while the unsaturated fatty acids will bind um, loosely because they will not fit together as tightly as the saturated fatty acid because of the presence of the cis double bonds in them. The presence of the cis double bond will cause a bend in the unsaturated fatty acid which will interfere with their packing. So the type of fatty acid affects the packing of membrane lipids within a lipid bilayer, which is which will which is an important um, determinant for uh, membrane fluidity. So besides the phospholipids uh, that and sphingolipids that are important constituents of the lipid bilayer, uh, cholesterol is also an important constituent of the lipid bilayer, and it is it imparts rigidity to the cell membrane. As you see in part A of this uh, figure, you see how cholesterol is uh, intercalated uh, between two phospholipids. Uh, so uh, if you look at part B of this figure, you see that the cholesterol is um, intercalated within each leaflet in such a way that its single hydroxyl group is close to the polar head group of a neighboring phospholipid molecule. This hydroxyl group forms a hydrogen bond with the oxygen of the ester bond between the glycerol backbone and a fatty acid. The presence of cholesterol imparts a rigidity and broadens the effective melting temperature as I have already mentioned. And so now we see that lipid bilayer is a kind of uh, an aggregate that is spontaneously formed when bulkier lipids are placed in an aqueous solvent. The lipid bilayer has a different constituents. So it has phospholipids, it has cholesterol, it has sphingolipids. The packing of the fatty acids, the kind of fatty acids that are present um, or are a part of the phospholipid will decide what kind of a, a packing will occur within this lipid bilayer, thereby uh, imparting uh, fluidity uh, to the lipid bilayer. So by now we know that the plasma membrane is semi-permeable and is composed of uh, phospholipids, sphingolipids, cholesterol, etc. And it's a fluid structure. Uh, we're now going to see that this, uh, how this fluidity can be regulated. So what do you mean by uh, fluidity is regulated? Uh, when an organism is placed in a condition or an environment which is not optimum for its growth, it perceives that particular environment as a stress. So the first defense mechanism that this organism will throw in in order to protect itself is to uh, kind of change the membrane uh, fluidity so that it maintains the semi-permeability, na semi-permeable nature of the membrane even in this uh, stress condition. So there are enzymes that can bring about a change uh, in membrane fluidity 
and this membrane fluidity is changed by regulating the lipid composition. So, uh, how, how can the lipid composition change when fluidity has to be changed? Uh, the one way by which lipid composition can be changed is by changing the ratio of uh, 16 carbon to 18 carbon lipids via enzymes called as hydrolases because we know that the smaller lipids will have a lower TM. So, the, the organism will start to synthesize long chain hydrocarbons in order to uh, bring about a change in the fluidity of the membrane. The other way by which the fluidity can be regulated is by changing the degree of unsaturation and this is brought about by an enzyme called desaturase. This change in fluidity is important for bacteria, plants, reptiles, amphibians and hibernating mammals because um, by, by, by providing, by changing this membrane fluidity, they are able to survive in conditions which are not optimum for them otherwise. We know that the third type of lipid aggregate are termed as vesicles and uh, liposomes are classified as uh, vesicles that are bilayered. So basically, what are liposomes? Liposomes are simple concentric bilayered vesicles or bags that enclose aqueous or polar solutions. Liposomes are generated artificially in the laboratory with a solution of pure lipids. Since liposomes consist of natural lipids which are biodegradable and biologically inert, they are uh, less toxic uh, to the human host. Uh, their membrane bilayer is uh, mainly composed of natural or uh, synthetic phospholipids uh, and so they mimic the biological membranes. Liposomes were discovered by Alec, Bangham and group since the hydrophobic edges of the membrane bilayer are in contact with water as we saw in previous uh, picture or diagram. Uh, since the edges of this bilayer are in contact with the aqueous solvent, the bilayer is stable and this bilayer uh, folds back on itself to form vesicles. So, vesicles are spherical structures just like the micelles but Unlike the micelles, vesicles have a aqueous interior. So while vesicles uh, are formed by spontaneous folding back of the membrane bilayer in vivo inside the cell, liposomes are bilayered vesicles that are generated artificially in the laboratory. Since liposomes uh, are bilayered vesicles and uh, they are made up of uh, natural lipids, they mimic the biological membrane. And since these vesicles have an aqueous interior, liposomes can encapsulate both water-soluble as well as fat-soluble drugs and can be used as vehicles to deliver these drugs to the target sites or diseased sites in humans. The bilayer of liposome is similar to the biological membrane and so they can mimic the biological membrane uh, in many ways and they are uh, best used as drug delivery vehicles. So when liposomes uh, encapsulate water-soluble or fat-soluble drugs and when they are injected into the uh, human host, these drugs that are encapsulated within the liposomes are slowly released as the liposome is broken down by enzymes or acids by cells found at the disease site. For many fat-soluble compounds, uh, the encapsulation of these compounds uh, can take place within the lipid bilayer of the liposomes. The encapsulation of water-soluble or fat-soluble drug in the liposomes can be done either when uh, the liposomes are being made or it can be done after the liposomes have been prepared. For injection into the animals, 
liposomes with cholesterol in their membrane are considered uh, to be more stable in the bloodstream. So let's have a look at the advantages of uh, liposomes when they are used as vehicles to carry drugs uh, that need to be targeted to a diseased site in the human host. The first advantage of encapsulating a drug in a liposome is that it reduces the toxicity of the drug which in turn will increase the pharmacokinetics of the drug such as the efficacy and therapeutic index. So by now we know that since liposomes are made up of natural lipids that are biodegradable as well as they are biologically inert, so the toxicity of the liposomes per se is very less uh, in the uh, human body. And because these mimic, the liposomal membranes mimic the biological membranes, uh, they can uh, slowly uh, release, they, are, I, they can slowly release the drug inside the bloodstream or to the targeted disease site. So once these liposomes enter the human body, the enzymes or uh, the acids that are produced by cells at the disease sites will digest the uh, liposomal membrane and will result in a slow and sustained delivery of the drug which will increase the efficacy as well as the therapeutic index of the drug. Selective targeting to tumor tissues or any disease tissues can also be done by using liposomes. So liposomes can be uh, attached to antibodies that are specific to uh, an antigen that could be present in the tumor tissue or any disease cell. And then these uh, liposomes can be selectively targeted to the disease site which is what we mean by selective targeting to tumor tissue or disease cells can be done by liposomes. And like I said, they are carriers for controlled and sustained drug delivery. Besides that, liposomes can also be made into a variety of sizes. And as we have already seen that there are different kinds of liposomes that are formed like multilamellar vas vas vesicles or single unilamellar vesicles, etc. So these are the different advantages of uh, using liposome as a carrier for drugs. So while liposomes have all the advantages that we listed just now, there are also certain disadvantages that are associated uh, with liposomes. So there could be a situation where the drug or the encapsulated agent can leak, which, which is not good because then it would not maintain a sustained delivery. Plus, it would also increase the toxicity of the drug in the system. Although liposomes uh, mimic natural biological membranes, but they are still identified as a foreign uh, body in the system and so could easily be taken up by the reticuloendothelial system. Uh, there could also be batch to batch variation in making liposomes and so the uh, percent efficiency with which the drug can be encapsulated uh, could vary from uh, batch to batch preparation of these liposomes. There could also be a difficulty in large-scale manufacturing and sterilization, although uh, there have been many advances in liposome technology uh, by which uh, these difficulties are kind of overcome right now. Plus, the liposomes also have a short half-life, so they would spend a very uh, small time in the bloodstream and then they would be degraded. But again, there are methods by which the half-life of liposomes can be increased. For example, one of the ways uh, by which uh, half-life of liposomes is increased uh, is by tagging the liposomes with polyethylene glycols, uh, which uh, make uh, these um, liposomes, um, which, which increase the half-life of the liposomes in the bloodstream. And these kind of liposomes that have the polyethylene glycol chains attached to it are called as 
stealth liposomes and they they are not recognized by the immune system easily and uh, are degraded um, very uh, slowly and so uh, it increases the half life or the time spent uh, by the liposome in the bloodstream so that the drug can reach its target site um, in the best possible way so what is the mechanism of formation of liposomes so supposing you take a pure mixture of uh, phospholipids and put it in water what will happen so molecules of uh, phosphatidylcholine for example will not be soluble in water and uh, in order to attain a energetically favorable uh, structure these molecules will align themselves in aqueous media as planar bilayer sheets as we have already seen that the uh, planar bilayer sheets are stable structures because the hydrophobic uh, fatty chain in these sheets are kept away from the aqueous solvent and the polar head groups are in contact with the aqueous solvent now since the edges of this bilayer sheet uh, are hydrophobic and these hydrophobic edges are also exposed to the aqueous solvent what will happen the bilayer sheet will fold on themselves to form a closed sealed vesicle which is termed as a liposome so this is the general uh, mechanism uh, that 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 lies behind the formation of liposomes if you use a pure mixture of lipid dissolved in uh, suspended in water during the formation of liposomes liposomes can uh, f- can attain different uh, structures and based on the kind of structure that the liposomes will attain they are classified as uh, multilamellar vesicles small unilamellar vesicles large unilamellar vesicles and multivesicular vesicles so you see in the figure uh, how the multilamellar vesicles uh, look like multilamellar vesicles would have uh, uh, layers uh, membrane uh, layers in concentric circles the size range of a multilamellar vesicle is about 100 nanometers to 20 meters and it will consist of several uh, bilayers uh, small unilamellar vesicles uh, are s- small as the name suggests and the size will vary between 20 to 100 nanometer and they will consist of a single lipid bilayer ideally single unilamellar uh, vesicles are considered to be the best uh, best um, drug delivery liposomes that can be injected directly intravenously into the patient without subjecting them to further sonication large unilamellar vesicles uh, have a diameter range from 0.1 to 1 meter and they contain a single bilayer while the multivesicular vesicles will consist of vesicles inside a big vesicle with a size ranging from 100 nanometer to 20 meter so we've seen that uh, there are different kinds of uh, vesicle sizes or uh, that can be attained uh, when liposomes are being prepared in laboratory so we've now also seen that on the basis of the size and number of uh, bilayers that the liposomes uh, have they are classified as uh, multilamellar vesicles or single unilamellar vesicles etc classically several unilamellar vesicles will form on the inside of the other with smaller size making a multilamellar structure of concentric phospholipid spheres separated by layers of uh, water when you are preparing liposomes in the laboratory so generally what you end up getting is a multivesicular uh, liposome uh, when you preparing these liposomes uh, in the laboratory so there are different methods that are uh, used for preparing uh, liposomes there is um, a passive loading technique there is an active loading technique passive loading technique is where the drugs that are that need to be encapsulated in the liposomal formulation are loaded while the liposomes are being prepared while the active loading techniques um, uh, involve the uh, drug loading 
after the liposome preparation has been uh, done with. Passive loading techniques uh, include uh, three different methods, uh, the mechanical dispersion method, the solvent dispersion method, and the detergent removal method. I will just uh, discuss uh, a few of these methods. So amongst the mechanical dispersion method, uh, sonication is uh, the most extensively used method for the preparation of single unilamellar vesicle. Uh, in sonication, uh, the multilamellar vesicles are sonicated either with a bath sonicator or with a probe sonicator under a passive atmosphere. And the main disadvantage of this method are very low internal encapsulation efficiency. The other kind of mechanical dispersion method that is uh, extensively used is the uh, French pressure cell, which involves the extrusion of multilamellar vesicle through a small orifice. There are other techniques uh, that are also uh, used uh, uh, that also fall under the mechanical dispersion methods like freeze-throwing liposome, uh, dried reconstituted vesicles, which I'm not going into the details here. The other method that is uh, used uh, is called the solvent dispersion method. And uh, amongst uh, the different methods that are listed here, the reverse phase evaporation method has uh, provided a, a progress in liposome technology since it um, allows for the first time the preparation of liposome with a high aqueous space to lipid ratio. So when you're preparing liposome, your main aim should be that you should be able to encapsulate a uh, maximum amount of uh, drug within the uh, liposomal uh, preparation. And uh, reverse phase evaporation technology uh, allows uh, to uh, increase the aqueous space to lipid ratio in such a way that the efficiency of drug loading is also increased uh, in the liposomes that are prepared in uh, this way. Then there are detergent removal methods, uh, uh, which include uh, very commonly used methods like uh, dialysis, uh, column chromatography, uh, etc. And uh, these, all these methods together uh, used in the laboratory will generate uh, liposomes. We have now gone through the different methods by which liposomes are prepared and uh, what are the conditions in which liposomes will be prepared and how liposomes are used as uh, efficient vehicles for delivery of drugs. So here you see a list of advantages of delivering drug through liposomes. One of the advantages that the drug is protected from getting inactivated if, if it is injected uh, as a liposomal formulation. Uh, there is a reduced volume of distribution and hence uh, there is a decrease in non-specific localization of the drug if it is encapsulated into, li in, into the liposome. Because the liposomes um, will uh, release the drug uh, in a slow and sustained manner, the therapeutic index of the drug is also high. Uh, and because the liposomes can can be targeted uh, specifically uh, to deliver drug at the diseased site, it also increases the concentration of the drug at the target site, thereby again increasing the therapeutic index and the efficacy of the drug that is delivered as a liposomal formulation. Uh, you see a table that uh, lists the drugs that can be encapsulated in the liposomes. Uh, one such drug is uh, amphotericin B, which is uh, uh, an antifungal that is uh, encapsulated in the liposome. And this liposomal formulation of amphotericin B is used to treat mycotic infections or infections that are caused by pathogenic uh, fungi. So amphotericin B is uh, ideal to be encapsulated into the liposome because it has a hydrophobic tail and a polar head group. So the amphotericin B intercalates within the bil bilayer films and um, uh, that is how a liposomal formulation of amphotericin B is made. When amphotericin B is getting intercalated between the bilayer of the liposome, 
uh, it uh, the first uh, the kind of vesicles that are initially generated during this preparation are the multilamellar vesicles these multilamellar vesicles are subjected to high pressure homogenization technique in order to generate single unilamellar vesicles these single unilamellar vesicles with amphotericin b intercalated between their uh, bilayer are ideal for intravenous injections and they are not uh subjected to further sonication when when this when they are injected into the patient this table uh lists all the marketed products that are uh, basically the drugs that are uh, used as liposomal formulation so like i've al already mentioned uh, uh, one of the most extensively used um, uh uh liposomal formulation is liposomal amphotericin b which is used to treat uh, fungal infections uh there's also a liposomal formulation of uh, donorubicin and doxorubicin which are anti cancer drugs that are used to treat uh, uh, kaposi sarcoma uh, or uh, are used in combination therapy with uh, uh, cyclophosphamide in metastatic breast cancer uh, patients Uh, so students uh, let's now summarize what we have learned in this module so we started with uh, the different forms of lipid aggregates uh, so we know now that lipids form aggregates when they are dispersed in an aqueous solvent uh, micelles bilayer sheets and vesicles are different forms of lipid aggregates that can be formed Uh, micelle forming ability of lipids has applications in medicine as well as in the washing industry as we have already discussed bilayer formation ability of lipids allows them to serve as constituents of all biological membranes while vesicles are bilayer sheets that are folded back on itself to form a hollow sphere liposomes are a kind of uh, vesicle vesicular structures that are artificially generated in the laboratory uh, with which which have an aqueous interior and this aqueous interior can be loaded with drugs and so liposomes have therapeutic implications